26, 2012, and we are interviewing Jack Wanstrap at the great at uh, his home in Long Beach, California. Mr. Wan Wanstrap is 87 years old. He was born December 30th, 1924. My name is Lynn Hutchison, and I will be doing the interview. And assisting me is Karen Wells. This interview is being done for the Greater Long Beach Chapter of the American Red Cross in conjunction with the Library of Congress and American Folklife Center. Mr. Juan Strath served in the Army during World War II as a sergeant. And first and foremost, I want to thank you for your time and service to our country. So let's get a little background information about you. Um, where were you born? Cincinnati, Ohio. And what were your parents doing at that time? My mother was just a housewife. She had nine children. Wow. And my father had a, a small restaurant and grocery store that he inherited from his father, oh. my grandfather. And um, what kind of restaurant? It was just a neighborhood mom and pop oh. shop. Uh -huh. it, was, it was a German neighborhood, what they called Cumminsville on the north side of Cincinnati. And it was a typical German neighborhood, and most of them were. In fact, they used to refer to it more or less as over the Rhine. Oh, yeah. Well, so you call, what did you call that area, Germanville? Cumminsville. 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 And there were nine of you. Nine of you. And um, what, were you, what were you doing before you went in the military? I was just a student in uh, high school. And then uh, from when I graduated in June, uh, I worked a few months in a supermarket and then got drafted and went right into the Army. And uh, where, where in the, the hierarchy of the siblings were you? Um, I was the middle of the boys. Oh. And then uh, I had three, all, there was five boys in a row then three girls and then one more boy and but he died of leukemia two and a half or two years old. Oh. So, so and you were the middle the middle, the middle boy. Of, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, were there any of your other family members in the military? All my brothers were in. Yeah. All your five of us at one time. And they were all in the military at the same time. Yeah. Was your dad in the military? No, he was uh, I don't know, he wasn't in World War I, no. but no, he, he wasn't in the military. And you said it was a, a German neighborhood. Did you speak German? Uh, when we were little, my parents spoke German a little bit back and forth, but we didn't speak no German. But my mother was more Ari, from Irish descent, but uh, she would speak phrases of German mm -hmm. that we'd pick up. And her, um, uh, Main name was Murphy. Oh. That was a good combo. Oh, yeah. Well, um, and you, what did you say about in 1938 what happened as far as German speaking people? In well, yeah, we, a lot of the people spoke German and they taught, taught German in schools in the early part of the 1900s. But then in 30, about 38, when Hitler was starting to rise, it got unpopular to speak German, so they stopped teaching German or letting you speak German. We went to Catholic schools, and a lot of the Catholic uh, schools allowed you to speak German, and but then they had to stop it. Never, ever since went to English, it couldn't be taught no more. Did the kids um, harass you at all for having being of German descent? No, well, because it was. We went to a parish that was called St. Boniface, which is a feast for Saint of Germany. Oh. And the whole parish was almost German, oh, yeah. so I didn't have to put up with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, were you drafted or were you... I was drafted. You were drafted. No, I wasn't going to volunteer for that. And did you, did they tell you that you were going into the army or did you have a choice of branches? No, I had a choice, yeah. They, they did, uh, after we took our aptitude test, they said that I could go into the Air Force because my aptitude test was high, but I just said, no, I'll stay and go to the infantry, mm -hmm. which a stupid decision. Oh, really? You regret that decision? No, I, maybe not. 
because I'm here today to talk about it, so God knows what would happen in the Air Force. So. Yeah. Well, what was the training like? Where where was your? I went from um, Fort. Uh, oh, I forget the name of the fort right in Kentucky. It was close to Cincinnati for my clothes and induction and all that. Then in about three days, they sent us down to Camp Landing, Florida, and we had nine weeks of training. And then they shipped us over to England to train with the English and. Uh, I joined the 1st Division there as a replacement from there. They had come up from Africa and Sicily. They saw action there and they were building the division back up to make the invasion. Of course, I didn't realize at that time that wasn't out to us, but that was the purpose of them being in England and training. We took extra training for invasion and did some maneuvers out in the channel ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And you, they, you had no idea. Well, after a while, after the first big uh, dry run, they call them, where they went out on the ships and we invaded a beach on the English soil. It was a mock invasion. Then we knew. But you knew we what? Had, we knew we were going to go into an invasion, but we didn't know where. Mm -hmm. That was not told to us about a week ahead of time. Did you have a sense of that this was big, how big it was? Oh yeah, because we knew what they were getting ready for all the time. The last two weeks for months we were told we weren't allowed to even leave the base. We couldn't go in town or nothing. We were requesting it. Mm -hmm. Well, so tell us about that, that you were in the first wave of D-Day. Why don't you give us a short history of how how that happened? How did D.A. was? Well, we went down to uh, Bournemouth, I think it was now. Some of the things getting a little vague, and got on the ships and troop ships. And we were supposed to go in the 5th, and it was canceled because of bad weather. On the 5th of what? June. June. Okay. But they had to hold it because the weather was so bad. So. Then finally Eisenhower had to make up his mind at the last minute to go in on the 6th, even though the storm was still bad and the English Channel was the worst it had been in ages. And he said he had to because he couldn't keep us on those ships too long. And uh, he made his mind up early in the morning and we start sailing over during the night. And I remember one of the prominent things I remember was being on it, I got up and went up on top and went up to the front of the ship. And I looked at all the, all I could see all the way back was ships. Oh. As far as I could see, this way, that way. And I thought, wow, this is history. I wonder if I'll be able to live long enough to tell anybody about it. So you knew right then oh, and there? Yeah, oh, we knew before that. Yeah, but, they gave us little maps on handkerchiefs and silk oh. of just the area of where we were and we knew it was Normandy but we didn't know any more than that. They confined each unit to a certain area and that's all they got to know about was their area. Mm -hmm. And uh, once they told us that we weren't allowed to leave the base, if we, we were guarded very closely. Well, so what did they tell you about that? What was the they just briefed us and said we'd be in on first wave and go in, and uh, we were hit oh, what they call Omaha Beach, and they expected maybe uh, fifty percent casualties. Uh, Utah Beach was another division, but they that wasn't as bad. They got in and made their target that day. They hit their destination, but there was much more resistance on Omaha than. Our intelligence told us they didn't know about that. That they had brought a Germans had brought a Panzer division up there, and when we hit there, it was I never really went from the boat to the land. We got off of the big troops on these uh, rope ladders into small landing craft, landing craft, the LCIs, landing craft infantry that hold about thirty six men. And then, I don't know, did you see the movie Private Ryan? Well, yes. you saw those landing crafts drop down the front. Right. So we got about maybe 100 yards from the beach, and we were all so sick. 
And I was never so sick in my life. Everyone just throwing up salt water all over us. Mm -hmm. And it just, I didn't care if I lived or died, really. Yeah. <laughs> I was scared. Oh. But then when we got, I'd say about 100 yards, the boatswain made her, I think they call them boatswain. I'm not sure. The driver is a Navy personnel, and I'm not, I forgot all those terms, but he had a special name. He got hit. And then the boat just started going any which way. And oh. we're, so this, we were told to get off, take our packs off and get off. So we had to swim and walk the best we could. And I didn't know how to swim. And to this day, I don't know how I got to the beach. Well, and were they? They did, were just firing right into the boats yeah. as they dropped the front down and picking us off. Did anybody, I mean, did you want it? I mean, I, did anybody want to just stay on the boat because they were petrified? Or Not, I didn't see any of that, but I heard later that some of them froze. Mm -hmm. But I think mm -hmm. he just reacted. Mm -hmm. I, I really can't say I participated because I think I was disconnected. Mm -hmm. I just did what everybody else was doing. Yeah. You just. Uh, well, and how long was it from getting off the boat till you... We landed on there and it was close to 2 o'clock in the afternoon before we got off the beach and really could get inland. We just laid there and tried to find cover until somebody could get over. And then finally there was a, a colonel, I think, we landed right by the 29th. The boat left us in a different area where we should have gone in that didn't land there because the guy got killed and the boat just kept swirling and got off course. Mm -hmm. And then when we landed and laid on the beach and tried to cover, it was a colonel that says, we're going to either die here or die trying to take it, so let's get off the beach. And we just all got up at once and it seemed like a lot of firing, a lot of shooting, and people dropping next to you. All of a sudden, we were over the top of the hill. But it's vague. I can, when I'm alone and sometimes even sleeping, I get a clear picture again. I can connect. But when I'm just uh, trying to connect, it sometimes gets hard. Mm -hmm. The first day on the beach, I remember lying there because I thought, well, I'm going to die at 19. I was completely reconciled to death. I don't think when I die now, I'll be that reconciled and ready to die as I was then. Mm -hmm. I just was subject and just toss myself over. Here I am, Lord. Yeah. And, and I was waiting for it. The anticipation just was getting unbearable. And being Catholic, I remember I was saying, Hail Mary. I never could get past the two words, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary. I never could get past that. <laughs> and uh, then the old sergeant come by and said, Mary, whoever you're talking to ain't going to help your ass. Get up! <laughs> 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 oh. So, they, uh, oh. Um, I'm sorry. So you, um, so when you went forward, what happened after that? Well, then we just had skirmishes, and then we came into what they call these um, hedgerows. They were big rock roads, and they had dirt over them and trees planted years ago, century ago, and the farmers used them to keep the wind off of the crops. They were squares. So you had a, you couldn't see over what was behind it, so you had to take one of those squares at a time, yeah. just hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Well, so how, how far was that from? We were supposed to get in three miles, I think, the first day, and cut off a road to Sherburg. Oh. And, if that was cut off, they couldn't get supplies back and forth. Mm -hmm. We never got near our destination. We didn't get to take that road that first day. We got it the second day, but we didn't get it the first day. So, so was the third day just surviving? Just or were, were the you... first day we were just surviving. And I think when night fell, I could still see the ocean. Oh. It was just over the hill a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then some, a few German planes came over and dropped bombs on us and strafed us. And then uh, we were there a couple of hours, I guess, and then we start going through the night, fighting through the night when we could. Mm -hmm. 
and they they lost so many of their tanks and weapons, big heavy weapons, they just got knocked out down in the in the water. And oh. We didn't have the backup of tanks the first uh, half a day or half sometimes the whole first day. Mm -hmm. Then the second day tanks start coming in and we got a little more backup and then we start moving, but it was very slow. And then it, it was just hedgerow to hedgerow and we did that till the uh, towards the end of June, I think it was. So... The city, city. Comont was the first city I think we took. Comont? C-A-U-M-O-N-T. Comont. Comont. And so, those hedgerows, how far away were they from the, the waters? Once we got over the hill, uh -huh. they began. All that country oh. is built like that. They're farmers, it's, it's um, apple orchards and flax and then um, fruit and flax is, is a big product of cheese up there, but it was dairy farms and there would be a, the fields, up, but they're surrounded by these big rock terraces, or they called hedgerows. Mm -hmm. So when you get in one, you can't see this way or that way, or that way you got to just get up right close and crawl up over and look over. Oh. And it was hand to hand, you know, close by. And then that first night, that was one of the most traumatic things that I'll never forget. We were in the hedgerow, on the ground, laying down, and they had crossfire coming from one corner to the other corner of the hedgerow, shooting uh, machine guns with the tracer bullets over our heads. So we couldn't get up. Mm -hmm. We had to stay down. So they brought some tanks that had landed. So they brought some tanks in, America but it was getting tanks. dark, our tanks, <clears throat> but it was getting dark and I don't know who gave the command for the tanks to come in and try and help us, but the tanks come in and it was twilight and getting dark and they couldn't see us laying on the ground. Uh, and I'm laying, I could hear that tank getting closer, 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 and all of a sudden I could hear the wheels turning and the guy, he couldn't have been from here to here from me. Mankiewicz, his name was. The tank just rolled over him. I could hear a splash. And all of the innards and blood and everything flew all over me. Oh. And that stayed on me. That uniform was so funky and smelled so bad. And I it was two, three weeks before I could get a change of clothes. Oh. And I wasn't the only one. Everybody, I think 50% of us lost our bottles and urine when on the beach itself. We mm -hmm. just lost all of our body function from just I guess fright. I don't know. A lot of guys say if you're scared you're a car. But after I got home and start talking to other people, I would never admit I was scared. They all said they were scared. But I thought it was cowardly to say you were scared. Mm -hmm. And their doctor told me if you weren't scared I'd send you to an insane asylum. Yeah. So it was a long time though before I was willing to say I was scared. You just couldn't say that. People would take you as a coward if you said you were scared. But now it's all different, they understand. So how did you finally get out of that hedgerow? Hand to hand fighting. I pulled the tanks back when they saw what was happening. And then we laid there till morning. When morning came we got artillery support and just small gun and tanks had a 90 millimeter gun on them so they were shooting into the hedgerow and boop, getting it down oh so we could get over it and see in it but they'd break down the resistance on the other side for us mm -hmm. and then we'd go over the top of that hedgerow and the guys and germans that didn't get killed from the tanks firing then we had to just fight them hand to hand or shoot them you know and they were shooting us, but there was one guy I was talking to and I got no answer and I looked and he was just on the ground. Mm -hmm. Well you, and you said that you wouldn't forget the first man that you shot. The first man I shot close was I was in combat about three weeks I think. It was usually at a distance and that wasn't so bad because you didn't know for sure 
if your gun killed him or not, you know, unless he was the only one there and you aimed. But I, up till that time, I was just aiming at the guys and didn't know if somebody else was aiming at the same guy. So I, I was I would keep telling myself it wasn't me that killed him, it was somebody else. It wasn't my bullet. But then there was we were doing some house to house fighting, going through rooms oh. and ran into a guy. And he couldn't have been more than my age, maybe younger. And there was a hesitation like in you saw on that kid on the stairs. I didn't know what to do because you're so close and I, he looked like he didn't know what to do. And I shot him when I, he went down. He, uh, maybe I'm imagining this, but he looked at me like, I wasn't going to shoot you. Why did you shoot me? Mm -hmm. But maybe I wanted to think that, but he had this pathetic look as he went down and that stayed with me the rest of my life. And it, it, I just felt like I committed murders because it was so close, so personal. Mm -hmm. Because I knew I killed him, but I suppressed that too with alcohol. With alcohol, well, let's let's keep on uh, keep on your story here. I mean, we I want to cover that too. But um, you went from from uh, Caromont, Caromont, Caromont. 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 Now there were so many little villages that we went through quickly. I can't remember all. And of so them. you were moving. Were you moving? We were moving towards a city called Saint Lo. They were oh, going to yeah. make okay. a static front, and then hold the front, so they could get supplies in, and then make a breakthrough. Yeah. So from June, I think the twelfth or thirteenth of June, we were dug in, and then. We stayed there in St. Louis till July the 26th, I think it was. Wow. Dug in the foxholes. And myself and two other guys went out about a quarter of a mile further than the rest of them. And we had to dig in and they called us point men. If we would, if they were trying to come through our lines, we would see them first. They'd have one about every hundred yards three guys here, three guys here. We were ahead of the front mm -hmm. and we were dug in deep and we stayed there we stayed there from the twelfth to the twenty sixth in that one foxhole. Wow. Smell, it was terrible. It was terrible. If I get on the bus today or to smell anybody with B O or something, I sometimes have to control myself but I don't throw up. Really? And I have a hard time here because of that. Mm -hmm. Because some of these old people can't bathe. It's not their fault, they just can't. Mm -hmm. And I really have a hard time with that to this day. So how long were you a point man in that that foxhole for that whole time? For that that was like yeah. was five weeks? Yeah. Five weeks in that hole. Well they would they would bring us back for a day or two and bring three other ones in and then send us right. There was just one squad of us that kept rotating. Oh. That's eight guys that kept rotating at. And then when you went back, where were you going back to? Just another foxhole. Oh. See, the, the main line was back here and then they would put us up in front. So mm -hmm. if they would hear us firing or getting mm -hmm. fired, they'd know there was a breakthrough and they could give them at least a few minutes to get ready for it. Yeah. Then on the 26th, they broke out of that thing. They had enough uh, uh, supplies. And we made the big breakthrough of, through St. Lowe and the English made their breakthrough. And we that's when we rolled across France real fast. Went to Mortain, Avarange, south of Paris, and just kept going, going until we got stopped up around Belgium. And that's when I got hit. That's when you got hit? Yeah. So I was in the hospital then when the Battle of the Bulge came. I wasn't involved with that. So that you were July twenty sixth was when you made your move north we, from Saint Louis. Awesome. Well, we were south of Paris. We had some troops. The English were north of us, and we had other American divisions south. And we just the whole units, all the units, the whole army, many armies, the corps, just made the push through and made the big Falaise Gap. They went around a big city and captured I think two divisions at one time. And how long did that take? 
we broke out the 26th, and I think the 8th of August, we uh, troops went into Paris, but we went south of Paris. That was going fast, and that's the time when Hitler got uh, a, a tempted on his life, and almost assassinated, yeah. and we really thought the war was going to be over by Christmas, for sure, oh. because we were moving so fast. <clears throat> then I got hit on a September the 7th. And that was uh, 1944? Yeah, 1944. And that will tell tell us about that. Well, we were in Belgium, and it was getting dark, and we were setting up for the night to defend ourselves, and they made a counterattack. And uh, were you in foxholes at that time? We didn't get a chance to get dug in yet. I wasn't in a foxhole. Oh. And we were just laying on the ground because they had us pinned down, and uh, I got up for something I don't know what. I guess we were going to move on. We were try to get up and fight back. And uh, I got hit in the legs, machine gun. And then I got, went back to England to the hospital. Well, when you got shot in the leg, I mean, what, what did they do after that? Were you, uh, were you conscious? Well, you yeah, I, would, uh, I laid there quite a while because it was dark. It was twilight and just getting dark. And they couldn't get to us because they had us pinned down with small arms fire. And about uh, two or three hours later, I finally got a medic, and he stopped the bleeding and put uh, some sulfur on it. Mm -hmm. We didn't have none of the modern antibiotics or anything yet then. And then they, he helped me walk back to the company headquarters, and when I got there, they sent me on back to the hospital, and then they sent me to another rear echelon further back, and then C-47s, Picked it. They put some of them on C-47, some of them in field hospitals. It's according to how bad you were, what they thought they had to do. And they flew me back to England to get cleaned up and fixed up. And how long were you in the hospital? About uh, September, October. About two months. They gave me physical therapy. My muscles were damaged. And they had to work on the muscles and get me one again. But then when the uh, Battle of the Bull started and the Germans made that huge counterattack, I didn't think I'd have to go back, but they were sending everybody back that they possibly could, and then they sent me back. What did that feel like when they said... Well, you once you know what you're going to go through, when you went in the first time, mm -hmm. you have no idea. What you don't know, you can't be scared of. But I knew what I was going back into, and anyone that says they wanted to go, I really, I'm hesitant to believe them. Now, I don't know about the Iraq war, I can't say that because I don't know, they got all this modern equipment and I don't know how they do that now. But in those days, I don't know if anybody would have said, oh, I want to go back with my buddy. Yeah, yeah. That sounds a little... Suicidal to me. So you went back, and that was uh, that was. They, we, they were in Germany by that time. So that was about November. No, uh, I was in a replacement center for a long time. They were waiting to get troops. They would try to get you back to your same outfit, or maybe oh. reassign you to another. Mm -hmm. And during that time, when the Germans made their counterattack, everything going on in the rear was all messed up. I mean, there was a lot of what they call snafu, and uh, it was almost uh, January before I got back, and then I went back, yeah, in January or first of February, I'm not sure, it was either the end of January or February, and then I was on there till March, March, I think the 21st. Of 45? 45, yeah. yeah. And um, did you get back with your unit? Yeah, I got oh. back with my unit because I requested that. And how many of how many men survived Omaha uh, in your unit? When I went back the second time, I didn't hardly know anyone. Oh, really? There was one guy in the replacement center with me that had been hit the same night I was, and he was going back. I knew him, and. Uh, First sergeant was gone, the company commander was gone, but I found out later that he had gotten battle fatigue and kind of went off his rocker. And, 
Mm -hmm. He was pulled out. And uh, my exec officer survived. I saw him in 94 here. Oh, you did? Yeah, I don't know if he's still alive now. I went back every 10 years in 94, 2004. Mm -hmm. I went back to Omaha Beach. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh. oh. And I, he was still alive in 04. And he's the only one I knew. What What did it do to you when you went back to Omaha? It was a, a, a lot of memories, but it didn't get me as upset as I thought. In fact, it kind of calmed me and I think it did good for me. It was good for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I saw what I, how bad it really was when I look at that hill of now and I, as reality sets in, we accomplished a hell of a lot that day. Even though we didn't get what we were told we had to get, I think we accomplished a lot. Well, what I've seen, I don't know how anybody survived with the Germans on the top of the hill firing. Uh, yeah, well, we didn't expect that either. Yeah. We told, we were told the Air Force would have that all wiped out, and of course they're not going to tell you the truth. But then they did say that they expected 50% uh, casualties. So. Well, it sound, from what you said, it sounds like it was much, it was more than 50%. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think our unit, the battalion, got close to a little more than 50%. That doesn't mean they were all killed. They were casualties, some wounded and had to be taken back. Mm -hmm. But then it was quite a while before we could get replacements in to build this stuff to strength again. Huh. But in my company, per se, I only knew one person that would survive, other than myself, was that exact officer. I met him up in L.A. and then again in Omaha Beach. The Sophie's Hill Hotel had a big banquet for all the survivors from D-Day in, in 94. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Governor, or President Reagan, he was out of office and gave us golden cufflinks with uh, the presidential seal oh. and then his autograph on the back. Wow. And I had mine stolen from him. Oh, that's all right. I, I never was much, one much to say who's that kind of stuff anyway. Mm. Well, um, so you, you, January of 45 is when you went back. I went back. Then I went back in the hospital and they classified me as no more combat. Because why? Why did you go back? Well, they said that I had, uh, at that time, they called it anxiety, psychoneurosis. It, I was in, a, I would tre tremble too much, and I really couldn't be of any use. When I pick up a gun, I couldn't aim, and a sergeant saw me shaking, and he just pulled me off and said, "Go back to headquarters." And then the captain saw me and says, "Go back. You're going back to the hospital." How soon was that after they they put you back? How soon was it? I mean, like, you, they, they... One day he saw me, and then at, by that night I was back in the hospital. And that was one day after they, you got there? No, no, no. Oh. No, I got back there in January, February, and it was March the 21st. Oh. I lasted till then. Oh. But we were near Aachen, Germany, and we were in, uh, it was block-to-block -block fighting, and I was in this huge building, it must have been an office building or apartment houses, marble, beautiful building, and they were bombing it. And I don't know if it was our artillery or what, anyway, the bombing and the noise and the echo just got to me that day. And then when I, we got out of there, when that was over, the sergeant noticed me shaking when I was picking up my gun, because I had been there a long time and he knew me well. And he could just come over and pull me up, just go back to headquarters. And he pinned some kind of note on me, and that was it. And were you relieved? Were you no, I was embarrassed at first. Oh. And then when the doctor told me, I'm going to mark you, and he said then he, when I was in the hospital, they also said that I had asthma from allergies from the uh, ground and the trees and this and that. And he says, it's not bad, but I'm going to make sure you don't go back. Oh. 
I don't know why. It just maybe I was lucky I to get a doctor like that, or he just thought I had enough. Mm. And uh, they then they reassigned me to a petrol company and station in Paris. And I, I when they put me on the train, I didn't know just where I was going to go till I got in Paris at the train station. And then they had a jeep waiting for me, and they said, "We're taking you to that company." And I knew it was going to be right in Paris. I thought maybe they'd transfer me to another train or take me to an air base. I didn't have no idea. And when I got there, they said, we're going to train you to work in the office. Oh. And uh, I became the company clerk for that POL company. It was petrol, oil, lubricants. We were sending gasoline and oil out to all the units. Mm -hmm. So I fell into a nice job there. And that was, that was uh, like, that was in uh, March, April of 45. Oh, okay, yeah, so that's a good way to get, that I'm glad that they had the, the foresight to see that you'd had enough and that you, you were useful, but you didn't need to be on the battlefield. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what they were doing. They'd reclassify you and put you in a non-combat role. And so here you are, 21, and you're in Paris? Yeah. Ooh. No, I wasn't 21 yet. I was still 20. 20. But oh, I was still in the service. Then, then I took my separation in Paris in that company because I was contacted by somebody from the State Department and they says, uh, we're keeping some soldiers that are, we need for certain jobs here till we train the French and German. And you got a good recommendation from your company commander that uh, your office work is good. Would you like to take a civil service job for the State Department? Oh. So I took the test and I passed it. And All right. Got a four-year contract and stayed there. My family went berserk. So you, the, the, the war ended in August of 45? It, 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 it ended in uh, August of 45. Yeah. And May then, of 45 in Europe. 5th of May or 6th of May when Hitler capitulated. Right. And then uh, I was in Paris when that happened, work, in, in the, working in the army. Oh. And then when, but I had enough, they had a point system to get out. So many points for each decoration and every point for six months, every six months in the combat. So when I got out, I had enough points to get out. Uh -huh. So I just took my separation there. And so yeah, so here you are, twenty one. Now you're twenty one, yeah, and, yeah. and you're in Paris, and you not yet. December, I would have been twenty one. Oh yeah, okay. So you're twenty. And I celebrated my twenty first birthday at Maxine's. All right. Oh. I had made a lot of French friends working in the embassy, and when I was twenty one, they took me to Maxine's. Oh. So that's where that that was your job when you went to Paris was in the embassy. Yeah, I it's a clerk. Just oh. Like clerk. And what was Maxime's like back in those days? Well, then there was like the old Maxime's in the 20s and 30s. What did it look like? Oh, gorgeous. All this Tiffany's drop ceiling with lights above it, plush red seating, and uh, waiters in tuxedos, and women in formals. And they'd have every 15 minutes change orchestras of revolving bandstand. They'd play tangos and then waltzes. And then swing, you know, the Paul Whiteman type of music. They had a they had a, a revolving stage. Yeah, and then they have entertainment. Maybe the big singers of the day, like Josephine Baker and Edith Piaf, and you know, oh. it was nice. It was I thought, wow. wow. And I learned fast though, <clears throat> but I had good mentors. I met a lot of very nice people, you know. And I learned how to eat the continental style, <coughs> holding your fork and knife and so on. <laughs> you had to pick up fast because they would check our fingernails and hands every morning. You had to wear clear nail polish. And they were very strict with our appearances there at the embassy. Mm -hmm. We wore out uh, uniforms, but they were like the press or the, uh, it was an officer uniform, but it just had US, US. And you could wear your medals now, but you didn't have no rank or anything. Uh. And then they, you could almost send your whole pay home because they would uh, bill it you in hotels, and that was part of your job for for the job. They would bill it you, 
and you could, could and you got your three meals a day. You could eat at the army mess, or if for twenty five cents, you could eat at the officers mess. Oh. <laughs> so it was nice, but I used to get invited out to dinners a lot by the French people because I made a lot of friends processing and I'd do paperwork on passports and stuff, mm -hmm. you know. So it was nice. Oh, yeah. And what you said, what, what were you saying about your parents? <clears throat> your parents. Well, my mother right away, <clears throat> why would you want to stay over there? There's a lot of American girls here, you can right away, she thought I was going to get married. Don't worry about it, you know, because I didn't have that much to go back to. I wanted to go back and work in a supermarket again, yeah. and that's not going to happen too often, get a job, if it's just for four years, you know, yeah. that's good experience, and it, besides the experience, it was having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to turn that down? Yeah. And uh, I really enjoyed that. Then when. Towards the end of my contract, they sent me to Germany. I was in Gießen. That's a university town. That wasn't too good because it was still a lot of the city was bombed out pretty bad, and our building wasn't too good. So when my contract was up, I came home. Oh, and then what did you do when you got home? I looked for work, and it was very hard very hard to get everybody coming home and I got home four years later. Yeah. So there was a law out then it where you worked before they had to hire you back. If even somebody, even four years later they had that, that law? Yeah, that stayed in pretty long. Hmm. Because a lot of the boys had just got into service in the last few months of the war and they weren't ready to get out yet. They were gonna to go to Japan and invade Japan. So it was Good four or five years for everybody from the Second War got out. Oh. GI Bill too was extended real long. So uh, finally, after looking and looking, I went back to the supermarket and then they interviewed me and they said, "Well, Beans, you gained all this experience and everything. We're going to train you right off as a manager for a store." So about six, eight months, something like that. They said, "We got a note, Bean, if you want to go out of town." And I said, okay with me, you know. My mother again, oh, why are you going out of town? I said, what's here? I said, I'll get a promotion, make more money. You know. So I went out of town and I stayed with them for many years. What town? Out of town. I was in Cincinnati. I stayed with them uh, five years. And then I decided I'd like to come to California. So they gave me credentials and recommendations to come to California. The, what store? Ralph's. Oh, Ralph's. Yeah. So, and that was, um, when was that? Like, that was in the 50s? 50s. Uh -huh. 50, 53. And why did you choose California? I had a brother come out here and he was telling me how nice it was, you know, and, mm -hmm. and Cincinnati gets these real cold winters. Well, I was terrible in the winter time, mm -hmm. and uh, the slush and snow and California looked nice and attractive to me. So I come out here. <laughs> did you I get had, married? No, I never yeah. did get married because after I start working for mm -hmm. Ralph, I got the wanderlust again. Oh. And then I went into photography and I was working as a freelance photographer. Oh. I went to East Africa, <clears throat> uh, did work and sold pictures. Wow. Then I went a year into the Peace Corps in Ethiopia. Huh. And then uh, I saved my money and bought a cocktail lounge and restaurant down in Long Beach here. Oh, you did? What was the name? Where the Bank of America is now. On Long Beach Boulevard and uh, Broadway. Oh, uh-huh. That was little buildings and we had a cocktail bar in there. What was it called? The Safari Room. Safari Room. Um, and did the war affect you personally when you, after, after you were home? Just that I drank a lot not to think. You drank a lot? But I was always functional and always made good money. But then when I got into the photography, everybody I knew it was in photography and new or in the magazine were heavy drinkers. Oh. Everybody I went with on an expedition were heavy drinkers. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that was, but that's just 
And uh, then when I got the cocktail bar, that was perfect for me because I didn't drink. I was my best customer. No, but it was very, very lucrative. And I would work six months, and I had a good manager, and I would take off and do my photography work and make oh. money on the side. Oh, yeah. And then I figured, like the bookkeeper told me, if somebody's stealing 5%, don't worry about it, because if you have somebody honest and they can't bring business in, you're not going to make no money. No. If you have somebody that's stealing 5%, but they can still show you a good profit, that's yeah. just part of the turf for the business. Yeah. So I, I had a good manager. I knew he was stealing a little bit, but I didn't worry about it. Because <laughs> I was making enough of that. That's all I wanted. I wasn't looking for, a, you know, big things. Yeah. I just wanted to be comfortable. And I wanted my freedom. Well, that sounds like you got it. <laughs> Did you, how long did you have the safari room? From 1958 to 1980. Oh, you had it for quite a while. Yeah. And did the drinking ever catch up with you? Yeah, after I closed down the bars and started to, and stopped doing the photography work and I kind of slowed down and I, it finally I surrendered. Mm -hmm. I went to the VA and said, I give up. <laughs> and now I was 58 then, and I haven't touched the drop since. Really? Or so. maybe a little wine when I go to dinner or something. Mm -hmm. Once I got therapy from the VA and they told me it was post-traumatic stress, I was med medicating myself and that. Mm -hmm. I found the reason and I found a different outlet and I went through many years of therapy, one-on-one. -on -one. And my psychiatrist is still here today. And in fact, I went out to dinner with him the other night. Oh. We became very good friends. And uh, he's the one who took me to see Private Ryan. And I, now I know the problem. I know what it was. And I don't have the urge to drink. Mm -hmm. I can go out with somebody and they can get soused. I don't care. Well, so you, you, you correct self-corrected yourself pretty early on. Well, in 58, the... yeah. Yeah. But I mean, they said at 58 when I was in therapy that only 3%, 3% will not go back to drinking. Oh. At that age, oh. you were pretty well set in, in that habit. Hmm. And I did have to kind of drop some of my friends that would say, oh, come on, you're not as much fun when you're not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, the drinking kind of stopped me from doing things I like better than drinking. Mm -hmm. So I had to make a choice. I liked to go into the symphonies and the operas, and I had friends that never got like I did, you know, drank that. So I said, I, I still want to do things and have, keep my good friends. Because mm -hmm. the, the good time Charlie friends, when once you stop drinking that, they forget about you anyway. Mm -hmm. They're not real friends. Well, so then from when you closed down the bar in 1980, well, you were already, how old were you then? 58. Oh, the, okay, I that's... I think 58, yeah, something like somewhere that. Somewhere around there, so... And then I, then I got back into photography, and then at 60 or so, I kind of just stopped everything. Mm -hmm. Just went traveling around. Well, that sounds like All a... All the money I made, I spent on traveling. Well, good for you. Good for you. I had no obligations, no wife or nothing. Yeah. Else. Well, and also we see, I see here, you have a purple heart, and that was from being wounded. That's when I was wounded. And then, um, what's an ETO? That's a European... Um, Theater of Operations. Ribbon. Three battle stars. What, does, what, did, what did you... Normandy, Northern France, and Germany. Oh. And then tell us about the bronze arrowhead. That's for anyone that uh, dropped behind enemy lines and parachutes airborne into combat where the enemy is around or anyone that comes in on water and faces the enemy direct. Mm -hmm. I think you had to arrive before 12 noon that day to get the bronze arrowhead. Oh. They cut it off at 12 noon because they wanted to make sure it, the ones that were there first got a little more recognition. Yeah. Well, how many, do you know how many men were, were there in the first wave? They started off in the first wave. It was it. First Division, 
29th Division and the 4th. Those three divisions were the initial. Then they had the English, the Canadians, and mm -hmm. Polish, and French, every ball, the different allies that were helping us. How many are in a battalion, roughly? I knew all those facts and then, but I... I mean, is it thousands, or is it it's a, hundreds? There's three, 36 to a battalion. Everything's in three. Three companies, then I three. A battalion is a street company, about a hundred, two, four, six, eight, about a thousand to a battalion. So they were like three. When you, if, when you start counting cooks and backup yeah, people, yeah. It, it raised it up a lot. I don't well, know. so really, so just as a rough estimate, the first wave made up was made up of roughly 3,000 men? Oh, no, more than that. More that than that? Way. I yeah, mean, in many, many battalions. Oh, I thought you said the first wave was the first 29th and 4th Battalion. No, division. Or division. And division is made up of three regiments, and a regiment is made up of three battalions. Oh. So you're getting, I think that there was close to 9,000 casualties wow. the first day. Wow, wow. Now that doesn't mean they were all killed. That means people were shot and right. they had to go back to the hospital and stuff like that. Yeah. I know Omaha Cemetery there now. I think they said 10,000 bodies are there. Oh. But that's counting everybody that wanted to get buried there and all the Normandy campaign from the first day till the 26th of oh. June one, or July when we broke out by St. Lowe. Mm -hmm. That whole section of France is called Normandy. And then from there on we went into northern France and that's another battle. So. Mm. Well, so in the presidential citation, is that? That was from Franklin Roosevelt for participating in the Battle of Normandy. Oh. And then we got another citation from him for, I think, Germany in the Hurricane Force. I'm not sure what it was for. But that's a, a citation you were just when you're, you, if you were with your unit when you got cited, you can wear it forever on any uniform. Uh -huh. But if you got it afterwards as a unit that you can wear it only while you're with that unit. If you get transferred, you can't wear it. Oh. But I could have worn it even if I went in the Navy because I got it. I was with the unit when Roosevelt cited us. Uh -huh. I participated in the battle that he cited us for. In this French... Quanta gear. It's a, it's a red and green rope we wore around. Oh, uh-huh. That also is a permanent part of my uniform. And I that was part of the, for Normandy or? That was for Normandy and then we also had one from the First World War, but I was only entitled to wear that one while I was with the First Division. But the one second citation, I was entitled to wear that forever in any uniform. Mm -hmm. And then we got it a second time, so I mm -hmm. could wear that anytime. Wow. Well, do you keep in contact with, I, I, will you go, do you still go to, are you going to go to the Omaha One Beach? 14 if I can make it, yeah. I don't know. After this last trip coming back from Thailand, that's a 22 hour trip and I oh, was beat. Yeah. See, the last eight years I was coming back and forth and I'm just getting a little too old to do all this jet setting, you know. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, well. That's understandable. I, I, if I feel good, I'll do it, you know. Because I, I still like the spirit is willing, but the flesh is getting weak. <laughs> <laughs> did, um, did you have any Red Cross experiences? The only time I saw the Red Cross was on the front. They brought a mobile unit up close. It wasn't right on the front. And you could get coffee and donut. Mm -hmm. And I had a bad experience with them. Oh. They charged us five cents for coffee and donuts. Salvation Army came up with their unit free. Huh. Well, boy, they expected you to carry pocket change with you while you're at battle? Well, we had script. Oh, French I see, script. I see. Yeah. And, uh, well, they don't do that anymore, you know. Well, I, they got a lot of flack from after the war yeah, for that. Yeah. And then when I was in the hospital in England, they said, would you like to go on a trip? when I was convalescing to Coventry and Avon on Stratford, or Stratford on Avon, where uh, Shakespeare was born. And I said, sure. So they took us on this trip and fed us. And the Red Cross Red thing. Cross. And when I come back, when I got paid, 
there was a deduction, and it said, for the Red Cross lends you money to go on a <laughs> And there was flack for that, too. <laughs> well, they don't do that anymore. So from then on, I used to just donate to Salvation Army. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry to tell you that I know you. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm. That's 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 in the past, though. Yeah, I mean, we sure. can say that that we we do we do good things. So, um, are you a member of any of the veterans' organizations? Disabled veterans. Oh, you are. Yeah. And um, and a member of the first division. Oh, you're still a member of the first division. Oh yeah, I got my certificate over there. I never did get around to framing it. Oh. And um, what do you think? What do you think your biggest life lesson you learned from being in the military? You know how to make a good military bed. <laughs> <laughs> the discipline of the military is still a little bit of that with me, mm -hmm. and uh, getting along with people. Realizing that I've been there and still alive, I never expected this. I used to think if I live through this D-Day, if I ever get home, I'm not going to take any from no one. Yeah. And I got over that quick, you know, I found out you got to if you want to get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am certainly great, grateful that you survived and there's, I mean, there's, Look at all that you accomplished because you survived. And I still, as long as I keep going, I hope to still do more. Yeah. How would you like to be remembered? Be with where? How would you like to be remembered? I don't have anybody to remember me. You have us. Well, just as a guy that did his duty and the average G.I. Joe, I guess. Well, you're my hero. Is there anything else that you would like to add? No, not really. I'm glad I did it, but I wouldn't do it again. Yeah, okay. Well, I think this concludes our interview. Thank you. And I just want you to know what an honor it is to be in the presence of greatness. I mean, you're a hero. And on behalf of the American Red Cross of Greater Long Beach, the Library of Congress and the uh, American Folklife Center, we'd like to thank you. And again, thank you for service to our country. Thank you very much.